in one of your talks you spoke about uh, in financial data the volume is very less for you to actually use it in a very effective manner like the data points are very less oh so okay can you elaborate a bit on that so this this was probably in regards to reinforcement learning uh, yeah um so so what happens is reinforcement learning is is very simple inefficient meaning you need a lot of data samples to make reinforcement learning quite work quite well now um depending on what your time frame is let's say um a minutely time frame um you know over uh, the course of you know um say 20 years when you you test your strategy there's only a limited number of of minute uh data that that you can have and it's actually comparatively small to to other uh, data sets that might be available and so it's it's quite hard to um to train a machine uh with a limited data set as you probably know uh and you know there's ways that that can be leveraged to get around this a little bit like like gen you know gans general uh, generalized adversarial networks and so on but they're not ideal because whilst they look quite nice on paper that they're, they're not necessarily reflecting a real proper market and if you you know they they they're probably very good in training other things but uh, in my at least my findings is that if you train uh, financial um, machine learning tools with them they are not actually that phenomenally effective because yeah. you know markets behave in a certain way for a very specific reason but um something that looks similar it might be similar but just not quite the same and and and, uh, and, and in finance that that can be the difference between winning and losing or it is the difference between winning and losing so um in in a lot of cases um those those market data are uh, sufficient to train a, a, a trading model um in the case of reinforcement learning however it can be a bit too limited um as a data set my experience is specifically with reinforcement learning that you don't need a lot of data to train a market when it's in a specific regime say say in a in a you know you can trade uh, you you know you have a a trending market you you can train a model on that and then as long as the market stays in that regime like like it the model will work extremely well but yeah. as soon as the regime changes then the model will just um collapse and, and oftentimes um give you humongous amounts of losses rather than wins um so that that's really that's really the issue and unfortunately a lot of those um ai tools that that are self learning um they're not necessarily not necessarily learning uh, uh very very specific intricacies of the market they they're learning yeah. fairly obvious patterns that that any trader would spot in like you know 2 seconds flat and and you you know what you're effectively doing is you're training a machine to do what some trader could do in 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 no time at all with a bit of experience and you spend yeah. a lot of time and money doing that um machines that really really are good at learning intricacies in the market like this they don't really quite exist yet um and I mean I I'm not I'm not 100% sure I'm not an expert in this but but my explanation for that is it's probably similar you know if you if you try to to crack like an RSA encryption key with a normal computer right it will yeah it it's 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 theoretically possible but it will take you I don't know 100 billion years or so or 100 trillion years <laughs> and 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 whilst it's it's doable it's it's not uh, you know it's not something that's easy to do whereas and, and in the markets you know you have patterns that are there but but they're just incredibly difficult to spot for the machines as we have them now you know because the machine gets lost in in the more obvious patterns yeah and so and so uh, in the same way like like it's it's difficult for a machine to to really extract 
uh, those those things. And this is also where probably a little bit of market understanding comes in because if you have that as a human, you can still perhaps yeah. spot that and and make make something of it uh, rather than hoping the machine will somehow do all the work for you. So on that yeah. point, uh, I just wanted to ask like, is this done? Because uh, uh, suppose we are training a neural network, what, uh, what uh, people generally follow when they have some a certain domain is that they feed uh, domain specific information to the neural network so that it doesn't spend its time in learning those obvious features. Mm -hmm. right. So uh, what type of feature, so it, it would be worthless if it is again learning the same obvious feature. So if we, if, uh, if the uh, model itself knows that moving average is a thing or mm -hmm. uh, let us say P and PH2E ratio is a thing. So mm -hmm. if we give these as inputs, it will perform fairly better, right? So mm -hmm. what are those uh, certain inputs that are like crucial nowadays that you follow while implementing models? Mm, well, it one addition to that question. Yeah. Uh, when the model will get all this data, there will be some mm -hmm. outliers like the 2000.com uh, dot bubble that burst in 2008 crisis. Mm -hmm. Then right now again, no model could have predicted the 50% fall that came in the markets almost during March 23rd or so. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how will the uh, machines understand these outliers or how will they filter it out when you are inputting the basic data? Um, well, well, a good machine is, is able to adapt uh, to, to those changing market conditions quickly, right? So, so I mean, machines can, you know, can do well in, in those. In, and usually what happens is when you, um, when you look at the, uh, uh, the performance of those, you know, uh, you, you say, say the market, like, like during the recent crash, you know, it starts crashing and the machine will probably lose a bit of money initially, but then it, it will very quickly see, Hey, the market's going the other way. So, so, um, it adapts and then starts effectively really doing extremely well in a market like this. Um, so that's, that's ab absolutely something machines can do. Um, what I said pre earlier is though that, that with reinforcement learning, it's not so easy because neural networks have this tendency to um, fall into local minima and then just adjust to one market condition and then they are too slow to adapt to a new one. But there's other, there's other tools that, that can do this, more simple tools in fact. Now, um, when you talk about input features, you know, there's just a lot of them um, and a lot of them don't really work. What you ideally want is some features that have some element of predictiveness to the market. Now, you could quite easily test it uh, in, if you, for example, take historical data and you do a linear regression between the, uh, uh, the, the, the input value and, and the forward return, you know, the future return in, in the next time frame, and you find there's a positive or negative correlation, then, then that feature is somewhat predictive. But then there's also, you know, second, third, and, and nth order um, um, relationships. And in fact, in trading, they're very difficult to exploit. They're, they're definitely there, but they're difficult to exploit be, because. Um, you, you know that they're very complex and very hard to spot. Now, now this is new, the job of neural networks to some degree, but um, in, in reality, what often happens is the neural networks, they also find like a much more sort of the very, really obvious patterns and, and the really subtle ones that they struggle with uh, a lot more. Uh, also, simply because of the noise that is present in a lot of financial data, um, you know, we've got, obviously not just just the, the price data and and you know when you when you do uh, machine learning say on as i said on images or, or you train a machine to play a game uh you know the pixels on the screen are always clear there's no noise but imagine you try to train that game but the screen is just you know in the old days where we had antennas the screen is completely blurry and noisy and then try to make that game work it's it's a lot more difficult and and that's really what that's really what the problem is uh, with, with uh, training those machines at the moment. 
if we had just like really, really clean markets without any noise, then that would be fairly easy, but, but it's not the case, right? So that's why, that's, that's why we're struggling a bit. And, and you know, if you wanna use good input features, you need to just do your research, uh, you need to find these correlations, maybe come up with some really genius ideas like the satellite images or the, uh, the golf scores, and you combine all them and then um, you can probably find some good edges in the market. Yeah. Okay. Uh, find predictive features in the domain you are making the model for, like for suppose features options and give the, those ratios as the input to your model so that mm -hmm. they do not, uh, so the model doesn't get stuck in uh, figuring out those ratios uh, by itself. Mm, well, you know, um, um, I mean, obviously, if you give if you give the model features that don't have any predictive um, um, element to it, you know, the model doesn't help you much because then you know, you know, if you if you just feed noise to the model, then uh, the model doesn't do anything. Uh, but then, if you actually come up with predictive features, that in itself is already an art, and it is probably the more important uh, uh, step. Uh, rather than and, and often what then happens is if you have those features you don't really need uh, neural networks anymore to crunch them you can just use them by themselves so it's a bit of a um, a conundrum there uh, you know when when you actually do find those features and you have a good set of features uh, you might find that it's much easier to use a really simple uh, machine learning or or even just do something like adding them up <laughs> or or something really basic uh, uh, in order to make your model work. And, and that's why, again, that's why, um, um, you know, I often say, oh, you know, try the simpler stuff first. It's, it's actually more important to find the right features than, than using a, a very sophisticated uh, AI tool. Um, because often what you put in might not be very predictive at all, so, such as, you know, um, um, if you use, for example, past prices, um, they they could have an element of predictability in there, but if for whatever reason some strange event happens, a tsunami or, or anything, your past prices have absolutely no um, no bearing on on what's happening in the future. And so, yeah, it's it's it it really depends, uh, and that that's where really the experience comes in, the research, you know, and the hard work. It takes a long time to find that. I want to stay on this question for like about one more question. Uh, sure. I just want to know that uh, currently all these trading firms that do algorithmic trading, what are those predictive features they are using? At least if we could know at least three or four could be very nice because <laughs> as of now from a local uh, perspective uh, for a person who is not into algorithmic trading, it is very hard to imagine what these guys are using. So yeah. Since you are from the industry, you must have some. Uh, so you, it is obvious that you know some ratios. So can you share with us like what is being used as key inputs to many of the models out there? So um, again, it's it's is um, there is no there is really it it really literally depends on every single instrument that you're trying to trade, and it could be different for every single instrument. Um, there is. There is a, a book that came out recently about uh, the uh, head of, of uh, Renaissance Capital, like the you know the biggest hedge fund in the world, um, um, Jim Simons. He's he's a mathematician, and it's basically about him and his journey, and 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 he basically got a very very good team of extremely smart mathematicians, computer programmers, and all that around him, and yet. It took him 13 years to become profitable with his uh, with his work, and the strategies that he uses um, is effectively not, in that sense, extremely sophisticated. It's more he's got this platform where he inputs lots and lots of just really really small inefficiencies in the market, and they all they do is they just search for them, and then if they find one, they just add it into the model, and then from all these small features, they just build a really big model. And there's not even, not even necessarily um, going through an AI. I, I, I'm pretty sure it probably doesn't go through a very sophisticated AI. 
it's probably much more of a, of a simple model. Uh, and, and obviously, they, um, uh, Rentec is extremely successful with their trading. They, I think they make over 60% uh, year on year for the last 20 years. So, so they're incredibly good. But they don't use any specific, very sophisticated inputs. They literally just use hundreds and hundreds or even, I mean, I don't know, even thousands of, of really, really small, even, you know, really faint signals uh, that they plug into their model. And this could literally be the cloud coverage uh, at, at lunchtime in, in a certain city or something like that. And then, you know, people use other things like, as you said, moving average uh, crossovers um, or I don't know, um, um, relative strength index. Uh, those are signals. Um, they may or may not be very predictive and it, every firm uses really, really, really different signals. So, so, so you can't, you know, the answer uh, about, um, 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 you know, the answer about, oh, what signals would you use is, is like, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> it's, they, they, it really doesn't, you know, sometimes really simple signals can be extremely powerful if you have the right system that goes along with it. So, so they might be good for one person, but they might be completely useless for another. I know this right. is probably not what you want to hear. From what I understand, like it is completely problem specific and for each uh, like mm -hmm. set of problem like you are pre trying to predict, you have to try out a lot of things to have yeah. like a concrete model for that problem. Yes, yes. Research is just absolutely the most important thing. Like um, all the people that are successful with their trading, they spend a lot of time researching, like a lot, a lot, a lot of time. It's, it's, but it's not only the research and it's also uh, having a really good trading infrastructure and all of this. Um, and people really spend a lot of time. Um, one of my uh, uh, colleagues, he was, uh, I think, four times uh, futures trading world champion, uh, Andrea Unger. Uh, he, for example, uses inputs to his uh, models that are completely different from what I would use. Like the, he's got a completely different philosophy, but but both of them work, right? It, it's not it's not one is better than the other. But um, um, you know, he the way he approaches trading is is a completely different philosophy, and and you know, both work. And you know, if if um, you know. For example, if you want to know a little bit more, like he actually has some good courses out on how to, you know, how to build good trades. Um, so, so, you know, you can definitely learn something from him, for example. By the way, I'm not associated, or I don't get any kickbacks from him, uh, but I like what he's doing. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. Um, and, you know, it's one way of approaching it. My way is totally different. Um, so, you know, it's 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 almost a personal thing you know uh, I, sometimes i say to to the students like you know a strategy that mike you know one person is is really a risk taker right and they go really in big and and you know they end up with massive drawdowns but but um then it comes back you know and and they can do this but someone else uh, that gets like a two percent loss gets a stomach ulcer already um so for this person um, um you would uh, you would uh, use a different, you know, they would have to trade a completely different strategy and they both might work. So I'm finally getting what the whole picture now about what is going on. Uh, yeah. So now uh, let us uh, talk about how this is done. Like for someone who is trying to learn uh, this process or who is mm -hmm. new in this field, like uh, how is, so from what I understand again is, there are two uh, fields where you apply this AI and ML. One is like portfolio optimization, like how much mm -hmm. to allocate to each uh, asset. Yes. And the other is uh, for the time re time series related trading that actually goes yes, on. Yes, trading day. signals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, for the trading signals type, uh, so what I understand is from the process, like my imagination is you fetch the data from somewhere through some APIs or uh, maybe mm -hmm. download it. Then you have some pre-trained models which mm -hmm. try to predict uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
which is given by an output function and which takes yep. finally the buy or sell call yes so is this so is this how the process takes place uh yes i mean before you do that though you have to do a lot of research so so you know we call that back testing and so what you do is first you get your hands hopefully onto a, as much historical uh data as possible so you don't want to start straight away with live trading um that's not a good idea um what you want to do is you basically build the same model um and you apply historical data to it and then see if it would have performed well in 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 the past and if that's the case that doesn't necessarily mean it will perform well in the future but at least it's a starting point and then you can uh, say well you know um, maybe i can uh, i can build something and and the way you do it is is you're right um, um you basically have a few components uh, to this you have a, a stream of data then you have a connection to the uh, to your broker or to the exchange so so you know on one hand you have the data coming in but then you have to make trading decisions so so you need to connect uh, to a broker or a stock exchange to send your trading signals and so you go okay you know i want to buy or sell something um and those trading decisions are based on the on on the way you process the market data so so you take the market data in you they feed your model and then the model basically in real time um, um, crunches the numbers and spits out those those trading decisions and at the same time monitors um, how well you are doing. But then that's not all, you know. So for example, when you do that and you build your own system, what happens if the internet cuts out or what happens if a server crashes and you're suddenly naked in a big position and, and you know, you have to have... Uh, contingencies for those things as well so a lot of uh, a big part of, of, of you know that, that trading is also to manage this operational risk that is actually quite a you know it's a substantial risk you know if you if your strategy cuts out right in the middle of a, of a risky trade uh, it's probably not a good thing and you need to find ways to to get around this and manage that so that's really important so setting up uh, this uh, whole infrastructure on a scale is probably for people who have funding or some big firm. Uh, but from a perspective of a person, like suppose if I want to get started now in algorithmic trading, mm -hmm. uh, what are the th what are good resources uh, that I should know uh, from where I should get the data, and what are some good programming languages and like how to go about when I want to dive in. Mm, so, so there's there's uh, several ways now. Now you're in India, and actually, I'm not too familiar with uh, the Indian infrastructure. So I can give you an idea about uh, what you would do uh, in the US or in Australia, for that matter. Um, so, so maybe a good way to get started if you if you really want to. Oh, so there's several ways. Okay, let me explain. So one way is uh, crypto trading. So, so what's really interested with crypt, interesting with crypto trading is that it's fairly easy to get started because uh, a lot of you can trade very small volumes. A lot of the crypto uh, brokers they have easy to use uh, APIs, and so you can just a lot of them they have uh, Python code on GitHub uh, it, that basically links into their APIs, and and you can just write a bit of code around it and and you know because they supply market data as well as execution um um you know for free you you can get started straight away uh, with crypto but of course you know there's a few things you got to be careful with crypto you know this counterparty risks so what happens if the if the exchange uh collapses or <laughs> all these things so you know um um but but it's a it's a good it's a good starting point. Another starting point is um, a lot of brokers offer a platform called MetaTrader or MT4. Uh, there's also MT5 now, and it's like a C-based uh, language that uh, you can use um, to build algos. And and it's uh, a lot of the time it's used for uh, currency trading. Uh, on, on also for CFDs, uh, contract for difference. 
So, so a lot of the meta trader is if you want to trade currencies and CFDs, then that's uh, one way of um, of doing it. And if you look around, uh, there's quite a few brokers that that offer this platform. So, in terms of programming, um, you know, there's a lot of documentation out there for meta trader. It's, in my opinion, a little bit on the clunky side, but it's definitely um, if you're if you're inclined. Uh, to do programming, then then you can easily learn that. Um, there, must be rule based. Like so, if you have to incorporate AI ML, you have to call a function from that language. Um, yes. And, uh, yes. So 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 you basically in MetaTrader as well, you get the data, so you can write like some code that 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 gets the data in, and then um, you write basically some a few lines of of executing it and everything in between. You know. You have like preset uh, technical indicators that you can use, and all that. So, so we could um, um, put on trades uh, that way as well. Uh, there, there's other things. Uh, so, for example, um, there's something uh, uh, called Trade Station, which people use. It's it's a, and it's got this programming language called Easy Language. So, if you're not like a computer programmer, Easy Language is a little bit simpler to learn than than other. Um, trading codes, although not that easy <laughs> in my opinion. But um, the, again, again, MetaTrader, uh, sorry, sorry, TradeStation combines a lot of those things. You know, it's it basically builds a complete backend for you to then, all you do is you just have to describe your trading strategy in a bit of code and you can uh, start trading straight away. So uh, that that's probably uh, the sort of stuff that is, is good for beginners. If you're a little bit more advanced uh, in, 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 in Australia and, and in the US, I'm not sure about India, there's, there's this uh, broker called Interactive Brokers. They offer an API, uh, which a lot of people use that get started in algo trading. Um, and this gives you access to a lot of markets around the world, which is nice. Um, and you know, then, then you have to already start writing some quite serious uh, code uh, to connect to this API, but it's also a lot more powerful than um, some of the other tools. And the good thing is, for example, with interactive brokers, you have access to foreign exchange, you have access to futures, to options, to equities. So it's already a little bit more um, professional than, than the other platforms, I would say. But then if you want to go really professional, then there's, there's tools such as uh, Tating Technologies, TT, which is like a professional futures trading platform. So, so something like this uh, uh, would then, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you're a professional trader, uh, you would then go to this or maybe Bloomberg. Again, I'm, I'm not affiliated with any of those companies. So, so this is just stuff that, that I've been using. Um, and, and obviously as you go more professional, then the cost will go up and also the complexity of, of what you have to do in order to get the trades into the market will increase as well. Then is Par and uh, then is Python and R uh, used only for building that AI ML model? And basically, you just call these functions from the languages that you mentioned, or the um, uh, platforms that you mentioned, like uh, professional trading platforms. So, is Python and R only used for building that mathematical functions? And then basically, you call it from another. Basically, you use these uh, functions in another platform. Mm, well, it, it it depends. So so um, for example, if you do crypto trading, right, the, the latency of your uh, usually a REST API or something like that is is so much that that well, if you use Python and you write it reasonably well, uh, uh, you know the latency of your Python program is extremely small compared to to the latency of the API, and so Python is is more than than sufficient. Uh, a lot of what we do now is is really a hybrid. So when we connect to the market, we want to be really fast. So we use uh, languages like C Sharp or C++ uh, or, or, you know, some people use Java to, to um, basically connect into the market to reduce the latency. But then um, for the, let's say we have a, a machine learning tool or an AI on the backend, we then uh, run this in Python and then we use um, um, some sort of uh, socket connectivity to have the two different programs uh, talk to each other. 
and so we we use we do all the um um all the data crunching in python but we do the execution in in a c language uh, to get the speed uh, so 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 a lot of what we do is is based around that right i get it now mm -hmm. faintly i faintly get the picture of what is happening uh, yes yes it's 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 complicated <laughs> it take, takes yeah. a while i mean took me well over a decade even after phd to even get get good right. results but, but it is enough i guess for motivation or just to get started yeah uh, uh, one of the things is i i like it it's it's fun because it's so multidisciplinary you know you have to know a bit of maths you have to know a bit of, of programming you have to understand a bit of economics and trading statistics um you know there's there's a lot of different interesting fields coming together and that that's what i enjoy about it so on a lighter side uh, did your physics phd help you anywhere in like in terms of domain knowledge where you actually tried to have a specific outcome from your model um yeah i, I would think uh, I, i would definitely think it helped me i mean to to you know uh, in a way conducting research you know that it's it, you know the way you, you know when you do physics you know you really learn to look at data that's really one of the things that uh, you know that that's what physicists do they really look at at data and they and they basically uh, one of the interesting things is in physics or science in general um that you see data and you create a story from the data you know like it's not just like charts uh, on a piece of paper but you look at the data and they tell you a story about something and i guess what you learn when you do a phd is to really read the story that that is inherent in the data and and then make something from that story that you see because oftentimes data you know you look at it and it's not really obvious what what the story is that they tell you and as you do a phd you know that that's what you learn you you learn to interpret uh, the story that that is contained in that and so uh, it's definitely helped me i mean and also during my phd i learned at least the basics of programming if 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 i hadn't done this i probably wouldn't have never even started this because i would have been too scared of programming <laughs> but uh you know because you know i learned that uh i i was quite happy to get started and and as i went along obviously my uh, i learned a lot more programming so i'm not a, a computer scientist by trade so i had to learn all this more or less as i go along uh, i'm definitely a much better programmer now i wouldn't say i'm i'm really good at it but uh, i think good enough <laughs> yeah. um and um yeah yeah so so you learn a lot of skills along the way um and and yeah you know any background really helps if if you un, if you know how to interpret data that that definitely helps you know if if you can look at a chart and that chart tells you a story then that that's a that's a good thing right so data interpretation basically helped you from the physics side yes yes for sure now the upcoming part that we want to discuss is for people who are more into ai ml stuff Uh, we only have a few questions for this episode uh, sure let us let us uh, take let us make another episode where we'll probably discuss technical details uh, <laughs> uh, a very in very detailed format but for now let us restrict because i guess we have already crossed about an hour uh, oh. so uh, whenever uh, you are building a model you like mm. you many of the people say that try to keep the model simple at first and try to use better data mm -hmm. uh, so how does one limit the model complexity like how does one know whether he is overfitting like where where does one draw the line yeah i mean um in in in, in finance it's again it's it's sometimes um you, you you get a real good feel for 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 it after a while and and to be honest um you can't uh, there, there is still a lot of a fair amount of experience that you get uh, over time where where you just intuitively know oh this is a good model for that uh, purpose and this is not um so i have used many many different types of models for different purposes uh, like machine learning models in 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 different strategies um and and they're not 
you know, they're, they're, they're really varying in, in terms of what you want. Be, you know, for example, if you use a, a, a decision tree or random forest, they have a very strong tendency to overfit. So you've got to be really careful uh, um, to use them in, 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 certain, um, um, in certain environments. Um, on the other hand, you know, a linear regression may be just a bit too simplistic. Um, you know, if you just use, say, multi, uh, multivariate linear regression, it may just be too simple a model uh, uh, for, for a lot of purposes. Um, again, if, if you use uh, neural networks, then, then they could be fairly... Um, they could be fairly complex and, and a bit too overfitting. And if you use neural networks, you probably really want to limit the number of your hidden layers uh, and the number of nodes that, that you use uh, in order to, you know, avoid that uh, a problem, at least to some extent. Now, um, what you said was pretty right. Like, it's, it's good to at least try to avoid complexity as much as you can and keep the model simple. And, and, and quite frankly, the, the best models that I'm running are the, the, the simple ones, not the complicated ones. And a simple model, well built and 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 well created and well executed, is is usually way superior to a complicated model. Um, you know, I've seen those people that come from a um, from a machine learning or from an AI background, and they do all this, uh, you know. Uh, Fourier transforms and then several uh, layers of LSTMs and uh, and convolutional neural networks and and uh, hyperparameter optimization with reinforcement learning and all this. I think that they're, they're really missing the point, uh, in my opinion. Um, maybe it, one day this this will work, but quite frankly, I've never seen this work. It it seems like an obvious thing to do. But when you actually try it, you will realize mm, something is quite right here. Um, there is something missing, and what's missing is the the understanding of the markets and the understanding of dynamics in the market. So, personally, I, I mean, I would not definitely not say I'm I'm an expert in in AI or machine learning. I use them as a tool as they are, and and I tweak them as much as as I understand it. But if you ask me uh, about the, the intricacies and complexities of AI, I, I probably wouldn't be able to, to answer some of it because um, I, I really I really use them. Um, I say, oh, okay, maybe that's a case for, for using a neural network and then I will, you know, read up on it. I will learn as much as I can about it and then I will apply it and see whether it works or not. Um, but if you get too... Uh, I would say hung up on 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 the technology you're you're really missing the point of <laughs> of making money <laughs> right um it's it's really more important to keep a focus on what actually works rather than what tools you're using you know it's like when you when you chop wood and you say, "Oh look, I've got a golden axe," <laughs> like you still end up just with chopped wood at the end of the day, right yeah. whether you have a golden axe or or a steel axe, it doesn't matter. <laughs> The message I get is that start with simpler model and then if they do not tend to work, then try to more complete or uh, try to move to more complicated models like RNNs, LSTMs and all those. Yeah. If you if you if you have to if you feel like you have to move to more complicated models in order to get things to work, most likely there's probably something wrong with what you're doing. Um that's that's often like what uh there's a few there's a few really basic premises here that that I often use, and so if the model gets even a little bit complicated, then there's probably something not quite right. So my models are really quite simple, um, and the other thing is, and this is probably the one that that I never never failed me. It and it's if if it looks too good to be true, it usually is. Um, if if you get really amazing results from your back tests. Uh, I would say there's a 99.9% .9 chance that it's probably wrong. <laughs> you probably made a mistake somewhere. So, so it's just, uh, or you overfitted or whatever. So, so, so this is something that, you know, that you, it's really good to keep in mind when you do this. So one more uh, reason for that could possibly be that uh, 
correlation might not always suggest causation right um or not not even that i mean i mean it it may well you know may may well be the case but but you know uh, just because it was the case in the past uh, it doesn't mean uh, that relationship still holds in the future so yeah you know you you, you know if you take say um if you take say the the just the us market the s&p 500 um and you take all the different possible pairs between them you could um calculate something that's called co-integration it basically looks of if if the 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 a pair uh, or the the pair bit of two stocks uh, forms a stationary series which means that it has a predictive element in it and so so you could scan through all of them and if you assume a p value of uh, 0 0.01 it means one in a hundred by pure statistical chance is probably co-integrated and if you have uh, 20000 pairs uh, you will find uh, uh, several hundred of them um, being co-integrated but mm -hmm. that is purely a statistical uh, glitch that doesn't mean that that any of them actually is is truly dead and it definitely doesn't mean they will be co-integrated going forward into the future so so you have to be really careful when you do this however you might find that say pepsi and coca-cola are not uh, from a strictly mathematical sense co-integrated but yet they might move together very well and, and they're actually tradable because they make uh, a fundamental sense to be traded together. Right. So yeah. I, have, I have some other questions regarding models like uh, how, how is, so from a microeconomic perspective, you are just viewing at your model, but uh, there are a lot of models into play. So how is the play between all these models? But I think we can stall some of these questions for now and keep them for a future uh, episode uh, because it would be again too much to discuss about. And like you said, uh, <laughs> there's so much you can talk. Like you can feel yeah. like days and days with that. <laughs> exactly. So now to just uh, as we move towards the end of the conversation, I think we should now move to something uh, which is more in what is like the future of. Uh, trading in uh, algorithmic trading like uh, what do you see quantum computers coming into the picture mm. what do you see as the future mm, well that's a that's a really good question obviously i'm quite excited about the idea of quantum computers because as a physicist you know um i find it really interesting and the f a couple of years ago i think it was in 2014 i actually put on the first it was the world's first hackathon on a quantum computer. At the time, we had a D-Wave uh, uh, that, that some uh, company kindly gave us access to. And we, we, we had a little uh, coding competition for quantum computer, which was really fun. So I'm, I'm really enjoying this. Obviously, we're not quite, um, we're not quite there yet. Uh, it will still be a while before we, um, before we really see quantum computers in finance doing real work. But I think it's probably already happening a little bit. I know that several companies are working on it. So that's definitely going to be um, interesting. And the interesting thing with this is also that because of the nature of, of say, quantum physics, we, we, there is no way for us to really predict what these machines can actually do. We, it's a bit, you know, when you, uh, back, back in the 1960s, when you had just a few transistors on a silicon chip, no one could have imagined uh, what we're doing now, you know, just sitting here uh, talking between Australia and India, seeing our faces. That was pure science fiction at the time. And even though there was perhaps this, this potentiality, it, it was in no way realized, right? And now it's just pretty obvious. And, and with quantum computers, it's going to be probably pretty similar that there's applications that we can't even imagine in our wildest dreams right now. <clears throat> And so it's, it's, and I'm not a very good futurist, so it's really hard for me to predict. I think what's going to happen is that the market's becoming more efficient and, and a lot more, um, you know, the technology will just, just mostly take over. Um, but I think there's also probably still room for discretionary decisions to be made, you know, that people maybe that are really good on screens doing this. Um, but I think ultimately it's going to be a bit of a, a ro robot wars or machines race. So, so 
I think we, we will probably see more of the same in that regard. Um, Before uh, moving on to the final question, I just want to let everybody know that Dr. Tom has a, a course on Udemy that he has put up for like beginners who want to get into this field. Uh, it is, I guess, quant, uh, trade like a pro uh, using Python in quantitative analysis. Mm. We will link uh, the course in our description below. Uh, oh, and, thank you. Uh, and Dr. Tom, uh, I would also like for you to mention some other books and resources that you would uh, recommend to the viewers uh, because there are a lot of questions to be answered and there is a lot of things to be talked but yes. uh, many of the books have like a lot of knowledge so what are those resources that you would like to recommend um so so i mean i mean um you know pretty much everyone you ask in in the field of trading um probably would recommend the market wizards books um it's it's they're, they're really amazing um especially i think it was volume 4 where they they interview quite a lot of uh, quantitative trading guys like Ed Thorpe, people like that. Um, it's a really fascinating book and, and I highly recommend that. Um, there is, if you, if you want to learn a lot, there's obviously nowadays a lot of uh, blogs out there which have a lot of interesting stuff. One of the uh, really cool resources that I like is the Quantopian lectures. Um, so, Quantopian is like a platform that that offers you know free market data and 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 also a trading environment, and I I think you know one thing is to to get yourself smart and and read a lot, but but another thing and this is probably more important is to be really practical. So when I started this like early in my journey, what what I always did is straight away when I had an idea, I started building a model like whatever I did any idea I had, I started building a model about it. And, you know, I got some market data, built a model and I built thousands and thousands of these models and you get really good at it and you get a lot of, and I guess that's why, you know, maybe I have an edge somewhere um, because I know how to build models really quickly now because I've done a lot of it. So, so one of the nice resources is the, you know, the Quantopian lectures, because uh, they basically show you not only the ideas, the theory behind it, but they also give you a uh, code uh, that you can use. But there's other platforms as well. For example, uh, recently Quant Connect uh, um, has been quite popular. It's another platform where you can write code and it basically test your ideas. And I think, um, you know, you know, reading blogs you know this it's it's all good and well but but what you should really do is uh, sit down and 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 build your own stuff and especially in quant trading all the really good models are, are obviously never published like all the stuff that works people don't really put it online so you you know what i often do is i go onto blogs and see what people do and i get a bit of inspiration from it and i go oh okay you know and i i learn from what they do, but then I, I, I put on my own spin and I do my own thing. Uh, and if you're into machine learning, obviously, then then um, Marcos Lopez de Prado, he put um, his book out, Advances in Financial Machine Learning. And I think he just about, he has or, or is about to publish another book, which I don't know the title of. Um, and another book that I could recommend is Ernie Chan's, uh, uh, you know, did this, he wrote three books, I think. Uh, the first one was uh, Quantitative Trading. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the title was, but Ernie Chan's books, they can be quite helpful. This is actually one of the early books that I read. Um, if you just really want to get uh, started and, and get an idea of, of how to write trading algos and how to think about quantitative trading, um, so th those basic books are really good. So I, I think I think that's probably uh, plenty to to go along with, and if you really want to learn. But yeah, don't forget to learn it uh, with all this programming. Don't forget to learn a little bit about market dynamics and and understand how markets work. This is really so. For example, what's the difference between futures, options, and 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 equities? How how do they or or forex, how do they behave differently? It's, it's good stuff to know. It's actually really, really important as well. And and a lot of that you can learn 
simply by doing it by by maybe just trading like small amounts of money and and seeing what happens um so, so i would say maybe 30 percent of the time read and 80 or 70 percent of the time sorry uh, can't even do my percentages 70 uh, percent of the time uh, um um actually uh, do hands-on stuff that that's really uh where where it's at right so i guess that's it from our side so thank okay. you so much tom for You're giving welcome. us your valuable time and now we it, we have just one final question which is a standard for all our episodes what is that one advice that you have received from your mentors that you always keep in mind and what is the one advice that you would like to pass on to our mentors that you have probably learned yourself um oh that's a that's a really good question well um i think i think um probably the most important thing is persistence um so the people that I see that that are really successful, they're not the smartest and they're not the the most creative or innovative, but they're people that you know can really stay with a difficult problem for a long time. And it's often this, the really smart people often they're so used to getting good results that they they quit early. So so if you feel like that, then you know then you're probably in trading is probably not the right place. You know, m most people that, that are getting good at this, especially quantitative trading, they're extremely persistent over long periods of time. So if you want to really know what persistence is, read uh, the book about Jim Simons and, and Renaissance. Uh, you, you see, you know, how long it took them to actually get any good results. Um, so I, I would say that's, that's what I learned. That's what I probably would pass on. If you really want to do this, uh, don't quit early. Like, stay with it for a long time and keep keep at it. Eventually, you, you'll be successful. Right, right. So, thank you so much. That's it for today's You're episode. Welcome. For the viewers, if you want to find and connect Tom, then you can definitely find him on LinkedIn. And yeah. we would appreciate if you if you like the video, then definitely like it. If you love the video, then we, you can subscribe to our channel. And if you learned something from it, then definitely share it with your friends. Keep on passing on the knowledge and keep on showing us the support because that is one thing that motivates us and helps us persist because as Tom said, persistence is really important. That's right. <laughs> so that's it from our side. See you in the next episode and keep looking forward to our videos. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure to talk to you.